from our State House studio in Montgomery. I'm Todd Stacy. Welcome to Capitol Journal. It has been a late night here in the State House, and it's actually getting later. The House and Senate are still in session, with the Senate, as of this program, debating the issue of gambling. That's where we'll start our coverage on an interesting day in the Alabama legislature. For weeks, we've been waiting to see if a conference committee tasked with ironing out the differences between the House and Senate gambling bills would produce compromise legislation to send back to both chambers. That happened today. Representative Chris Blackshear, who has helped lead the House's effort on the gambling bill, announced that the group had indeed worked out a compromise. Here's how he explained it as the conference committee met. It prohibits all forms of gaming with the exception of the following. A state education lottery, electronic games of chance, which means no tables, cards, dice, or dealers, traditional raffles, and traditional paper bingo. HB 151 also does not, and let me be clear, does not authorize sports betting. It is out. That was one of the biggest things. Sports betting is removed. It authorizes the Alabama education lottery in paper form only. Authorizes electronic games of chance at seven locations that were listed in the Senate bill. And there's as follows. The racetracks at Green, Jefferson, Macon, and Mobile, plus bingo hall locations in Green County, Houston, and Lowndes County. Lawmakers estimate this new compromise plan would generate more than $300 million in revenue annually. So, well, where would that money go? This was a key factor in this legislative negotiation. First, on the lottery, all lottery proceeds would go towards education. That could include achievement scholarships to four-year and two-year colleges and education employee retire retiree bonuses. Revenue from casinos, including a required compact with the Porch Band of Creek Indians, would be spent on non-education programs within the general fund. That could be infrastructure projects, mental health support, improving rural health care, whatever the legislature decides on an annual basis. A few more details of this compromise bill worth pointing out. The seven casinos Blackshear mentioned would be able to purchase a 10-year slot machine gambling license for 15 to 30 million dollars. Licenses could be extended by the Gambling Commission for 15 years with a casino's capital investment of 100 million dollars. They could extend a license for 20 years for a casino's capital investment of 200 million dollars. The tax rate for casino gambling would be set at 24 percent for the first five years and then could be adjusted by the Gambling Commission going forward. The House met and took up that House bill, House Bill 151, the Constitutional Amendment, and House Bill 152, the enabling legislation, on the floor this evening. After less than an hour of debate, the bills passed with more than 70 votes in favor. Blackshear told his House colleagues that this was the furthest he could negotiate on the gambling issue given the tough road in the Senate. All the lottery proceeds go to education, all the compact dollars and or and the dollars that go along with the um, gaming establishments and entertainment being used goes to a supplemental appropriation within the general fund. Also, we have in the House and Senate passed the language around um, the inability to be able to give donations from a pack from entities that are in this as well too. That prohibition will be in there. The plan had significant opposition, with 29 members voting against both bills. But nobody attempted to filibuster or delay the vote. Representative Arnold Mooney did rise to make several points about why expanding gambling in Alabama would be problematic. I felt like the bills basically allow full-scale Las Vegas style casino gambling statewide, you know, obviously no physical cards, dice, roulette wheels or dealers, but it's on a screen and you can play it, you know, that type thing as it's been described in our caucus meeting and, um, you know, on the floor here today. Um, you know, a compact will open up the process, I believe, once that occurs, should it occur with the Porch Creeks, and at that point, 
between uh, what's done there and the Department of the Interior, I think the effect is basically casinos in most places. After passage, both bills then were sent up to the Senate, which could debate the issue into the night and even past midnight. Senator Greg Albritton, who has been the lead negotiator on gambling from the Senate, said the vote would be close. Is this a fair compromise? What do you think of this? Anyway, it's a whack-a-mole like we've been having. Uh, you'll notice when you read through this, you'll see language from just about um, has been used in some version of this over the years. Uh, lots of uh, uh, cut and paste. Uh, and we think and hope that this will get the uh, 63 votes out of the House. We'll go there first for a vote. Um, and then if it passes, come back up, and then we'll have to get 21 in the Senate. We hope we be able to get that. It will be a close vote, I do believe. And it will be close probably in the, in the House, too, because there were several things the House needed, wanted. I'm not sure that they were able to get everything in that they needed or wanted. So there you have it, an eventful day on the gambling issue, and we're not finished. We are following the developments very closely, and we'll have an update on the next Capital Journal. The other big issue of the day, budgets. Both the Education Trust Fund and the General Fund budgets moved through committee today, getting one step closer to final passage. The ETF was in Senate committee, which approved it unanimously. One key addition to the budget was $10 million to help the state draw down more than $80 million from the federal government to make sure, tr make sure children are properly fed during the summer. That is in here, uh, $10 million uh, under DHR. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. So, Chairman. No, it's, it's your budget. So uh, you, you advocated and other members advocated. So that is under DHR. And I've talked to Commissioner Buckner, and that should be sufficient. Maybe a few changes based on conversations in the next uh, 40 hours or so. And then uh, hopefully we'll have a, an education budget uh, that will bypass conference due to my conversations with Chairman Garrett and his involvement even in this version as mine was in his. And uh, we send it on to Governor Ivey, hopefully for a signature. The general fund was in House Committee, which also approved it unanimously. Thanks to unexpectedly strong revenues, the committee was able to put an additional $37 million into the budget and $38 million more into the supplemental spending plan. Those funds will be spread out among state agencies. We received the governor's budget in the legislature, and the Senate had, had first look at that budget, and then they make their recommendations. So, as you heard me say, made, I made very few changes to the Senate version. We used additional revenues uh, to go back and plus up a lot of the line items to our agencies that were reflected in the governor's budget. We have a lot of shortages throughout our workforce in Alabama and certainly the employees that are staying with us and working hard. Uh, uh, we, we, we had the funding this year. You heard me comment about the, the SSUT taxes, the insurance premium taxes continue to be up, ad valorem taxes, uh, and, and of course the biggest being the interest on state accounts. Both budgets include a first for the state paid maternal leave for state employees and education employees. A woman would get six weeks paid leave after, after having or adopting a child. Men would also qualify in the context of adoption. That's never been offered in Alabama, so it's certainly something to follow. Both budgets are expected to be on the floor on Thursday. Coming up in our interview portion of the show, I'll be joined by Representative Russell Bedsell, to talk about his bill aiming to make it easier for local law enforcement to care for those in mental health crisis. After that, Representative Parker Moore will be in studio to talk about his bill cracking down on deep fake AI generated pornography. And one of his constituents has a personal story on the subject. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Keep up with what's happening with Capital Journal.
Welcome back to Capital Journal. Joining me next is State Representative Russell Bedsall from Shelby County. Representative, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. I appreciate the invite to be here to talk a little bit about some legislation I have. Right. So uh, you have gotten to across the finish line this legislation having to do with mental health and how uh, involuntary commitments happen, really involving law enforcement and the judicial system. Can you walk me through what this bill does? Yeah, that's right. You know, in my law enforcement career that I've been serving in 25, for 25 years now, uh, in one of my recent roles as the jail administrator, I really became uh, very involved and interested in the mental health uh, process and, and issues we have in our state. And I really got to see how the mental health, uh, those people incarcerated and those people that are in the criminal justice system and so this, uh, this bill uh, that I was able to partner in with some of the great people, Association of County Commissions of Alabama and some of our probate judges, mm -hmm. really help us to um, attack some of the issues that maybe were barriers. Maybe we can help and assist in that mental health treatment process to get these individuals the help that they need. Yeah, well I understand that also you're addressing substance use disorder yeah. and kind of some, some clarification in the, in the law there that, that are maybe as small change but it has some big results. My, no, that's uh, right. Some big results. That's right. I said on the floor when I introduced this bill to everyone that I thought this was one of the most meaningful pieces of legislation I brought in my time here in Montgomery and not because it's going to solve a problem but it's the next best step in helping to assist the mental health issue in our state. And so what you were mentioning there was that for the first time with this bill we're going to officially recognize a substance use disorder as a co-occurring di diagnosis to mental health. So many times those affected with a mental health issue, they turn to self-medicating in an effort to cope and to deal with what uh, that they're going through. And then inevitably that creates a substance use issue. So with this, have a co-incurring diagnosis. It opens the door for some availability of some funds that could help us through the mental health uh, process of those individuals who have that co-occurring diagnosis. So those funds could come from opioid settlement money if approved. Uh, but would be a huge step in helping us go after and, and treating those people with those issues. Interesting. Well, I know the bill is on the governor's desk, right? And uh, That's right. have you gotten any feedback from her and her team in terms of she planned to sign it, send back amendments, or are, are they in a good spot? Yeah, I think we're we're in a good spot. Uh, we had some communication earlier today with the governor's office and her team to try to get an idea of when this bill. Uh, might be signed into law. I, I think, you know, from the top down, uh, Speaker Ledbetter has shown his support from the very beginning, signing on as a co-sponsor to the House version of the bill. Um, so we're very hopeful uh, that this, this piece of legislation will get signed very, very soon. So if I'm a local sheriff or a yeah. jail administrator or a local probate judge involved in all the process and haven't been following this legislation, what can I expect to be different after this becomes law. Yeah, so what I described to you a minute ago was only one section of, oh, I would say four. The other three sections of this bill deal with the probate judges. We all know that the probate judge is very instrumental in the process of committing someone who, or helping get assistance for those people who need some uh, mental health care. So it establishes and helps expand the jurisdiction of the probate judge. Uh, notably, if somebody does move across county lines, it ex expands the probate judge's ability to bring that person back before his or her court. The next thing it does is, uh, is to remove the requirement that the person physically appear in the court. You know, sometimes someone is physically ill, uh, maybe they're in the hospital, but there needs to be some movement in their mental health proceeding. So it allows for provisions for them not to be there. And this last piece was something that I personally experienced in my law enforcement career was in the law, it specifically states now that if somebody is in the criminal justice process, the probate judge actually loses jurisdiction. What we've done here through this legislation is insert them back in, working hand in hand with the municipal judge, with the circuit judge or the district judge to be a part of the team. Perhaps it could be decided that this person, we need to pause the criminal justice process temporarily in order to get them some mental health care, maybe to restore their competency. So this allows the probate judge to still be a part of the process. Uh, and those are the people who have the most knowledge on how to get people help inside the, the court system. So that piece alone is, is going to be really huge for our probate judges, but also for these individuals who need some mental health assistance. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just so interesting how the conversation has shifted over the years on the is issue of mental health. Right. I mean, people talking with just a lot more um, focus towards care, towards right. help. And that just wasn't the case, at least not broadly, 15, yeah. 20 years ago. So, I mean, th that, that change is palpable. 
It, it really is, and, and I've been able to witness it firsthand. I see these individuals who have come into the facility that I was overseeing, and it's obvious that they do need some mental health care. And unfortunately for many of the officers, our police officers and deputy sheriffs across the state, oftentimes the best avenue to getting someone some help is unfortunately taking them to jail, and many of our jails across our state have mental health counselors and other services available. Um, and so they get lost in the criminal justice system. What we would like to do through this bill and others, and I promise you there will be more work done by the legislature, is we hope to get to these people and offer them mental health assistance before they get entered into the criminal justice process. Uh, but if they do, this bill does allow an av avenue for our probate judges to be involved in the process. Interesting. Well, look, congratulations on passing your bill. I know it took a lot of work because yeah. I, I saw the back and forth in the committee and everything. So we'll look forward to that being signed into law. Look forward to having you back on to continue conversations about this important issue. Absolutely, Todd. Thank you very much for this opportunity. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Click on the online video tab on the main page. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. Mobile native Leroy Satchel Page was one of the finest pitchers in baseball. Early in his career, he played for the Birmingham Black Barons and would go on to pitch in more than 2,500 games, throw more than 100 no-hitters, and play professional ball into his 50s, making a one-game appearance for the MLB Kansas City Athletics in 1965. Page was inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 1971, the first Negro League player so honored. You're watching Alabama Public Television. Welcome back to Capital Journal. Joining me next is State Representative Parker Moore from Hartzell and Leanne Cameron, his constituent. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you Thank for having you. us, Todd. So we're talking about this bill that you just passed and got signed into law. I, I saw the governor's bill signing ceremony today where she signed it into law uh, kind of a sensitive subject though because it's talking about artificial intelligence generated pornography I remember interviewing the Attorney General about this before the session because I know he's been involved in this issue so tell me about your bill and what it you know uh, what it aims to do yeah, so uh, essentially AI law is, is uncharted territory right now and one of the issues we're facing is, is there a lack of enforcement mechanisms for when crimes or what we perceive as crimes have occurred. And so my bill essentially would make it illegal to alter, create, or make any altered vi um, video or graphic image of an individual without their consent or knowledge. And it is in relation to any kind of sexual um, contact or conduct mm -hmm. or anything of that nature and so that is something that it was brought to my attention and so that's what I, I looked at diving into it and, and there wasn't anything on our laws so we, we took that step and started uh, working to address that issue mm -hmm. and it uh, my bill will for the first offense it, it'll be a class A misdemeanor and any subsequent offense will be a, a class C felony Interesting. And so, so Leanne, I understand you were a victim of some of this. Uh, tell me about Are you comfortable telling me about this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it started out, I received a Facebook message um, from a guy's wife that I used to work with, and I thought it was spam. So I kind of pushed it off, did, ignored her. Then she started reaching out to my family, my kids, um, my kid's father, and uh, he owns a business. So she was able to find his phone number on you know the internet. And she kept calling him, and I was afraid at first that it was the where they were trying to get your voice and you know scam your family out of money uh -huh. and stuff like that. So I kept telling him like, "Don't answer, just don't answer." I'm afraid I can't explain this to my grandmother. She raised me; she's 86. You, how do you explain this stuff to you know that generation? And um, so finally, he was like, "I'm I'm going to answer it," and I was like, "Okay, that's fine, but I'm going to call your mom while you're talking to her, I'm, or whoever is on the other line. I'm going to call your mom and explain to her." what's going on, that nothing is wrong with us, so don't, you know, don't do anything. Don't send anybody money or freak out, it's fine. 
So he did, and um, it wasn't spam. It was real. And um, she, she was had, trying to alert you to what was going yes, on. Yes, yes. Um, I have a 16-year-old daughter as well, so she was not only afraid for me, but for her. And um, so, um, like I said, it, it was very real. And she had found um, images on her husband's computer and cell phone, over 13,000 images. Um, were pulled where he had been creating this artificial intelligence porn using my face with a fake body but when I first saw the video I was like man this this you know this could really be me if I did this kind of stuff oh my gosh. Um, so it really looked like me and it was it was very alarming so um, I contacted you know who I thought I needed to contact I told my work I told um, you know the police station and then I also work on the arsenal so I informed my boss and then the chain there and ultimately there was nothing that could be done because this man had broken no real laws um, so I was working with an investigator at the Madison Police Department and he said you know all I know to tell you is you can email your representative you know that's about that's about all you can do unfortunately so I did I reached out to Mr. Moore here, and um, he he got this law put in place, and I think it's, you know, it's awesome. Yeah, I guess we sometimes don't know laws that we need. You mm -hmm. don't, we don't know that we need them until we know. Yeah. Right? right. Yeah. But I, I mean, incredibly violating, you know, kind of thing like that, but our, dealing with artificial intelligence, that's not a phrase we would have really even used five years ago, mm -hmm. so I guess we do have to constantly update laws for, for new threats. So that would now be illegal and, and be punishable by the penalties you're talking about. Yes, it would. And, and I, I think any, anything with AI is, is kind of still uncharted territory and we're, we're kind of learning, you know, as we go with this and when, and when stuff arises or occurs, then we will have to address that, you know, going forward because there hasn't been anything on the books as opposed to, you know, th things that have happened in the past with regular so we uh, regular crimes that mm -hmm. we've already had in place so you know i think that over the next several years we're going to have other stuff that we have not even thought about as we sit here today that we're going to have to be looking at addressing in regards to ai as well so i think that we're, we're taking a very proactive step uh, one of the first states in the nation that's actually looked at addressing some of these issues and I think, and, I, and I'm proud that we are one of the first that is setting the example for the rest of the nation to follow on these issues. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised at all that, that it wasn't illegal? I just was. Just considering I, how crazy that is? I was. I was super shocked. And I was upset. Like, I, I mean, I felt helpless. You know, there was nothing I could do. You know, right. I don't know. I didn't know if this man, like, I mean, this could lead to, you know, anything else. Right. So I was scared and, and surprised that there was nothing there. Do you think... Um, we should do more to raise awareness now that we do now that law enforcement does have this legal to this you know a new law new tools for enforcement do you think we should raise awareness so that other women you know who could be victims out there know what how they can go about um, not just raising awareness but you know putting th these people in prison who are doing these things yeah absolutely I do yeah well that's what we that's where we can help thank yes. you so much for yeah. coming and sharing your story congratulations on getting this uh, bill signed into law, and we'll be following this going forward, because it, it sounds like, you know, like you said, uncharted territory, we're, we're just now getting here. So yes. thank you both for coming on Capitol Thanks Journal. for having thank us. Thank you for having us. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capitol Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capitol Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Keep up with what's happening with Capital Journal.
The USS Alabama is a World War II era battleship that first served in the Atlantic Theater, but was better known for helping to take Japanese held islands in the Pacific between 1943 and 1945. During the Battle of the Philippine Sea, the Alabama's state of the art radar alerted the fleet to incoming aircraft, providing the Americans enough time to scramble fighters and decimate the attacking force. Later, the Alabama served during the Battle of Leyte Gulf and anchored in Tokyo Bay to unload Allied occupation forces. In 1964, the state of Alabama took possession of the battleship. Alabama school children raised $100,000 in nickels and dimes to help bring the ship to Mobile and create Battleship Memorial Park. The park features the Alabama, the World War II era submarine USS Drum, and an American military aircraft collection. Battleship Memorial Park is one of the state's most visited attractions. That's our show for tonight. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow night at the same time with more coverage of the Alabama Legislature here on Alabama Public Television. For our Capitol Journal team, I'm Todd Stacy. We'll see you next time.